Please continue to write while I redistribute these uh, other parts of the papers. And then when I'm done, we will uh, be able to get My name is Major George Washington. Remember that. You're going to hear it again someday. That's G. George W. Washington. Major British Army. Let's discuss your uh, parchment prompts of the day. So if this president, whoever that is, shut down the borders of your country, told you you could not move anymore, what would your response be? I'd, I'd create a posse. Create a posse? I've heard of posses. Hey, are we talking about like move countries or like anywhere? Freedom to move around the USA as in they're you know, relatively confined. Let's say, in the example here, let's say uh, inside of the county. You guys have a county full of uh, breakfast bacon, right? I'm crying down. Inside of the breakfast bacon county is no farther you can move. I'd say, so I'd I'd move I'd say home. Man, uh, I, guess, yes. I, see some, I see a rebellion on the horizon. Yeah. This is very confusing. This is very confusing to me. You are not loyal subjects to the crown? No. You're not? Okay. Well, where, as I stand, mark my words, George Washington, Major, British Army, will not tolerate that. I will not tolerate the rebellion inside of these colonies. I respect the crown. I love the crown. The crown is who we serve. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. So, you, you should have a journal entry here, okay? Have a date. This is two journal entries now so far. I don't take these up every single time, but I will. They will become a journal grade once we collect uh, 10 or so, right? Major George Washington, what's that? What's that like? Round shape? Well, it's time, so it's time to move along. Today, we'll be discussing the war between the, the French, what is the so-called French and Indian War. 
Uh, it's entirely confusing to me as Major George Washington of the British Army because the French and the Indian were on the same side. And they lost. They lost this war, but somehow, a uh, child with the headdress, will you pass one of these to every other adolescent? <laughs> somehow, <laughs> across time, space, and history, this conflict becomes known as the French and Indian War, right? That is what your future history books are going to call it, I promise you. But what we really need to remember, what we really need to remember is that the French and the Indians were on the same side and they lost the war. So it's very, if you were, if you were to uh, talk about a sporting match, you would probably call it the, uh, you'd probably name it for the two teams that were fighting, that were playing against each other, right? Not the one team that lost. So that kind of makes it confusing. Now, hey, my class here. It's very important for you to understand that the French and Indian War was the main cause of the American Revolution. How? How? We've been sowing the seeds of rebellion for quite some time now, and we have arrived at the French Revol uh, excuse me, the French and Indian War being the main cause of the American Revolution. I am, I am a time traveler, and we'll discuss my abilities on that in here in just a second. Please, please, don't take me away. Don't lock me up. I, I, don't, I, I didn't appreciate it when it happened in the 1400s, and I'm not going to appreciate it here either. All right, a little bit of background. A little bit of background on the French Indian War. We have our follow-along notes. It's time to paddle hard. You're going to see the words populate on the screen. Uh, hang on to your journal entry, because we will rediscuss that in a second. Hang on to the idea that I'm George Washington wearing a red coat. We're going to discuss that in a second as well, right? Background to the French and Indian War. There's a long-standing rivalry between France and England, okay? These are these two uh, European powers, old world, Europe, are both uh, exploring the so-called new world, and in doing that, well, it's probably understandable that a rivalry and a competition has developed. This war actually starts in Europe. Now, these two countries border each other inside of Europe. So uh, the, the, the fighting started in Europe and extended to the colonies. We may call that a proxy war uh, today. We might say that they were ex expressing their foreign policy through the conflict that was actually happening in the Americas, although that's not a term that they're going to use uh, at that time. Now, I made a big to-do about how our common vernacular is to call this the French and Indian War. They fought on the same side, and they lost. Guys, I'm going put to put myself in your shoes when I was your age. I thought for sure, for sure, that this was a war between the French and the Indians. And I actually recall asking my history teacher, so who won the French and the Indians? It's not a war between the French and the Indians. It's actually a war where they are on the same side and they stink and lose. So it is confusing that the war is named by uh, after the losers, and that even though there's two parties listed, they are they were together, not opposing each other. A more accurate way to think of this is the Seven Years' War. Okay, there's a little AKA there, the Seven Years' War. But unfortunately, in history texts, that's not really the common um, the common word we use. So just keep all of that in mind. A test question may call it either of these answers. You know, the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War were referring to the same thing. A little bit of a background. Now, a turning point in the conflict, or rather, this, this war becomes a turning point in the conflict between Great Britain and the colonies. I could, uh, I could have put up a picture of a couple of, uh, you know, rando colonials, or I think, uh, I think what will seep this in your brain the best is uh, polarizing or contrasting, rather, the uh, British and American uh, characters on, on the office. Keep in mind, just keep in mind that this is a turning point in the relationship between the colonies and Great Britain. We've sowed a lot of seeds, right? What are some other seeds that have been sown so far? Potential, you know, sources of conflict over the past hundred years. Um, slavery. Um, yes. The the, the oncoming of slaves. Yeah. Um, Salem witch trials. Salem witch trials. Well, that brings us into the idea of religion, right? The colonies are trying to be settled oh, as a religious British safe haven, but England keeps sticking their fingers into the situation. British. 
Uh, was that? Yeah, the idea that uh, so people who live here, they just want to live here. But England wants to extract all the financial gain that they possibly can from the colonies. And then how about uh, how about sending uh, royal governors into the colonies? But these these governors don't necessarily reflect the uh, the values of the colonial people. And then here's the big one. What's the cash crop that we care about the most? Tobacco. tobacco. So far, we will care about cotton later, Glenn. That's good. But we care about tobacco so far. Does the sale of tobacco really bring financial gain to the colonies or to England? Yeah, the taxation of it is bringing financial gain to England, even though it's a crop that belongs, or at least you say it's home, is in the colonies. So these are the seeds that have been sown so far. We're clearly on the brink of a fight. It's like, it's like Andrew, I was about to flip on you just, just a second ago. It's like, you know, the, the taps, the taps, the taps, the taps, the pokes, the pokes, the pokes, the pokes, the pokes. You're tapping your pencil a little bit. It's like that little sibling takes you to the brink. And then you just this is the chair flip. This is the chair flip, the turning point of the revolution. A couple of causes. All right, a couple of big causes. So in exploring the new world, um, the, both the French and the British have, ex, uh, have uh, explored past the Appalachian Mountains, and they're both starting to um, they're both starting to build forts into this new region. Ohio becomes a very popular area because of its potential for agriculture, because it's just you know it's off the coast. It's a bit of a new place to explore. So they're both building forts that are kind of overlapping in territories and it's obviously we're just kind of bringing ourselves to a, to a potential to obviously a potential conflict um, and also the speed at which this happened didn't allow time for ground rules to be set didn't allow time for treaties to be written and agreed upon it's all happening so fast and it's almost like first come first serve right um, whoever gets there first is the one you know finders keepers losers weep uh, it's a little bit of what's going on here, except the weeping or the griping is going to turn actually into a war. So here we see a couple of uh, forts, uh, red are British forts and blue are French forts. Um, now they did have distinctly different motivations. The French really just wanted to uh, focus on fur trapping. So I got the Davy Crockett hats out there, right? Because that was, that's kind of reflective of the French fur traders. Uh, whereas the British were interested in uh, just grab, basically land grab as much as possible. All right, so the first conflict, actually, hmm, that's a strikingly handsome young man. Anybody know who that is? Me either. It's George Washington, Major, the British Army. You don't look like that right now. Did you know that George Washington, the father of, the, of America, not always was in the British Army? Yes. Did you know that he fought and bled on behalf of the crown? Yes. You know, if you didn't know this before, I hope I'm making a, a formative experience for you here. I am George Washington wearing the enemy's colors, right? We'll start to call this red, we'll start to call this the, the red coat or the lobster back. Why is it blue? We use that as a derogatory term, and there's all varieties of cloaks and tunics and stuff like that. But so George Washington at age 21 actually is pretty responsible for kicking off the conflict between the French and the Indians. He went out to scout, see, I should, excuse me, I said conflict between the French and to kick off the conflict between the French and the British uh, overall. He basically went out to scout a particular fort, and uh, in doing so, it, it's almost, it was, a, it was perceived as an illegal military action, okay? So we could get into a lot of details, but just suffice it to say, to summarize, the fact that he was leading a military patrol into French territory was seen as an act of war. So in a way, and then any of the shooting that happened along the way was seen as a war crime. In fact, at a certain point, following a particular military loss, the loss of a battle, he actually had, had to admit to murder. In signing this uh, peace agreement, which is a temporary peace treaty, basically, he agreed to the fact that he had murdered a particular French general and all the soldiers underneath him who died. So now it's debatable as to whether he actually understood the language that he was reading and what he was signing. But more or less, George Washington was a very significant part of the beginning of the French and Indian conflict. This is a picture of him. Uh, basically, uh, the Fort Necessity is where his greatest loss occurred. 
or more or less, they were essentially outnumbered. And at a certain point, after a lengthy siege, after a lengthy battle, they they uh, surrendered. And that's what I was referencing, where he had to sign a, a surrender agreement, which admitted to murder. This is obviously an artist rendition, but this is him and his men make more or less making the decision to surrender because they realized if they didn't surrender, they would probably be killed. They were they were greatly outnumbered. Here's a, here's a little extra on George Washington, okay? This is my own research. This is just something I want to offer to you. Do it kind of quickly because we got to get some more information. George Washington was commissioned into the British Army militia at, at age 21. He uh, came in at the rank of major, which is actually higher than my rank in the Army right now. Okay? So for the 10 years that I've put into the Army, uh, I'm still not at that rank. But things were different back then, and they'd be like, hey, you, good-looking young man, you're... Here's your rank, right? And they gave him the rank of major. Um, he pro he progressed through the ranks pretty rapidly, and by the time he was 23, he was a colonel. And as a colonel, he was leading the entire Virginia militia. Now, there is a distinct difference between militia and regular army. Do you know what that is? Have you heard of these terms before? Well, do you know what a militia is? Civilians. Uh, civilians is a kind of a fair Would it be like a National Guard? National Guard is a very good characterization. National, uh, militia is what we might call Minutemen. Okay? They were the guys who were ready to, to, to uh, assemble within a minute. Uh, that's, a, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But they, were, they were civilians who were ready to defend their, their township uh, on cause. So like you. National Guard is a pretty good modern example. That's right. In fact, the, uh, the logo of the American, U.S. Army National Guard is a Minuteman, a militia. So that's militia. Now, with that, what comes with that? Do they have what? What do you think we? Uh, what do you think about their equipment and their training? Yeah, on the lower side, their equipment was probably personally supplied. So it's not like they all had exactly the same rifle. You know, supplied with a powder horn. Here's your saber. They basically brought what they had. So it's personal equipment. And then what about training? None. Yeah, little to none. None. None is probably uh, uh, not quite the right answer, but very little. They were amateurs. Like it's probably the best word to actually give it, um, uh, especially uh, if you want to make a sports analogy. They were amateurs, to compared to the professional standing army. So George Washington is the commander of the militia. With that comes a little bit of a decrease in respect. Okay, people kind of looked down on the militia. I'm just the point I'm trying to make is that it was not the same as being in the regular army. At one point. He appealed to be in the regular army, more or less dropped a job application and was denied. So he is chapped, you could say he's chapped a little bit by that. He's a little frustrated by that. At a certain point, he resigns his commission in the British, um, in the British uh, uh, militia uh, and ultimately takes, of course, we know he takes up arms with the rebels. He doesn't wear red, he wears blue, becomes the commander in chief, first president, father of the nation, all that kind of stuff. But to point out here, in 1763, Washington was a part of the first skirmish, the first fight against the French and the Indians. And because of that, you can directly say that he, uh, he, he has inspired the first shots of the future American Revolution. Because, I'm going to jump ahead of myself a little bit here, we will see that the French and Indian War becomes a major source of taxation. And it's the taxation that ultimately leads to rebellion. So in a big way, George Washington was a part of starting the American Revolution. Yes, sir. Why are you talking about yourself in the third person? Why am I talking about myself in third person? Because it's too hard to do a pretend French act or a British accent. Uh, so for, for so much longer. All right, that was a bit of a pull out. I wanted to speak of myself, George Washington. I wanted to explain how I wore two different coats in my lifetime. Now, what's distinctly different about George Washington, who fought for the British and the Americans, and Benedict Arnold, who fought for the Americans and then the British. Because he's a traitor. Benedict Arnold's considered a traitor, why not George Washington? He is a traitor for his adoption. He's not a traitor. That's a big he question. I kind of that's, to be that's a big question. I wouldn't really care to discuss that one. But isn't that interesting? It's not all about the fact that you change codes, but it's the motivation behind changing codes, right? We use the phrase turn coat a lot. George Washington turned codes too. It's just that his ideals, his values, his morals. Moving on a little bit, war is declared. I know you guys are riding along as we go. You're trying to catch the big facts. I'm trying to tell you the story that brings it all together. 
did you, uh, in your advisory class today, did you watch the uh, video on how to study well? No. no did your advisor did. show you that? No. Madeline? Yes? No? No? I slept. You slept? Well, that's, uh, ironically, it was talking about getting enough sleep, so I guess, uh, we just moved. I guess you were doing that. It talks about one of the study tips that it gave was try to make information into uh, uh, like the plot of a movie or a TV show. It said, even if it's not very interesting, and I hope you're at least trying to find my efforts interesting. So, boring. But even if the information is not very interesting, if you try to weave it into the, a storyline, like an action movie or a really good suspenseful TV show, you can start to study it and understand it a little bit better. So I, I hope that's kind of what we're already getting to, that I'm weaving a story and at least it, it, at least it flows like a story. Every now and then I'll do factoid pullouts and such like that. Obviously, I'm trying to drive home the idea that George Washington was in the British Army. Um, so I hope that's what you are taking about, taking out of my method here. So war is declared. The British sends Edward Braddock to drive the French out of the Ohio Valley, right? Because they want the uh, they want the Ohio Valley. Well, he was killed. In fact, he was killed right alongside George, uh, uh, along at the side of George Washington. Washington survived, but Braddock was killed uh, with Washington in his presence. And this is the real tip point to actually declare war in the colonies. Because the French, what is, it was an Indian ambush for the French of the Allies, because the French and the Indian had killed one of their big, big generals, well, it's on, like Donkey Kong, you can't do that, so now we're going to war. Let's compare the sides real quick. So obviously we got England in one corner, Ding! it's like a boxing match, France in the other. Who were their allies? The, in, the England had one Indian tribe as their allies, the Iroquois. The France had three others. The French Indians, uh, the French Indian allies were really involved in the fur trade. So that's why they naturally aligned with the French because the French were involved in the fur trade. And then the English, uh, the Iroquois who allied with the English, they're a little bit more urban. They were not as far out into the frontier. Uh, and just like, like the English were a little less into the frontier, so that's why the Iroquois were allies there. Look at that population difference. What is, what is the difference in a in the colonial population? Someone, someone do the math for me real quick. I think that's 30,000. No, 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 no. That's a million. Yeah, 930,000. It's a 1 million English colonists and 70,000 French colonists. That, Obviously, that puts England way in the majority, super majority. What, uh, what do you think a lasting impact of that is? There's more English than there are French. How then do they interact with the local natives, do you think? Bad. I'm not sure I said that quite rightly. Let me, let me say this. The, uh, the, the French were less intrusive than the English. It starts with being fewer of them. That's natural, right? If there's more of you, you're going to become more intrusive. But the French were far less intrusive than the English. They actually cooperated with the Indians. They kind of had the same values or the same mission because they were involved in the fur trade. Whereas the English are trying to grab land, take over areas, impose their laws, impose their preferences. So the, the religion is a big one. So the English were far more obtrusive, intrusive to the Indians uh, than the French were. So that makes the... Uh, you know, that makes the Indians want to naturally side up with the French versus the English. And then uh, colonial activities, kind of like I already said, the English were involved in towns and trade. The French, they were they were just kind of real focused on that fur trading, which kind of made them very similar to the Indians. So we always like to hang out with people that we have, that we have similarities with. The French and the Indians had a lot of similarities. A global conflict. You could say this was actually the First World War. Now, we don't say that because we have named it something else. And why is it why? Yeah. Hey, I'll pause. I'll pause. I didn't realize it was going back to the Oh, okay. You flip me to the back. Got you. I got you. Hey, better. Let me know when I can move on. Thank you, Washington. Look, Glenn, Logan's new to my methods. He doesn't know that I don't respond to it. When I'm in character, I don't respond to it. I got it. All right, all right, moving on. You could say, you could honestly, reasonably say that this was World War One. 
Now, of course, that's not what we call it. And World War II is World War III, but it was a global conflict, okay? So it actually, like I said, it started in Europe, and you can see the contrast between blue and green and who is on that team. I mean, it even gets into the South Pacific a little bit. They're fighting over port cities. That's what these blue dots are, is port cities. Obviously, it's most expressed in the uh, in the New World in North okay. America, but we got a you know we got some side lines being drawn in South America as well. So Russia again. The popular fighting, the, the you know the bulk of the fighting and dying happened in North America. But just keep in mind that this that kind of did rope a whole lot of other countries in, based on alliances, based on trade partners. Uh, and it kind of, it kind of becomes uh, accurately characterized as a global conflict. Uh, George Washington. Yeah, that's me. What happened to uh, Australia? I didn't have to say do it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess they're doing that whole uh, prisoner's colony thing in Australia. Let's pause there, head to the bathroom. And uh, let's go to the right, get a full-on brain break. That was, that was another study tip. Georgia of Jungle. George, George. George of Jungle, watch out for that train!
first you're gonna keep your mouth. Did you get that? Yeah. Oh, 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 Wear a hat if you're gonna wear a hat. Keep your hands to yourself if you're not. Nate. <laughs> Andrew C. Madeline. Madeline's not here. That's it. <laughs> She's like, oh, that happened. That was weird. <laughs> All right, so it was a global conflict, possibly it could be called World War One, but of course that's not what we call it. Early battles. Now, there's a there's a couple of specifics that aren't just super necessary. I'm just gonna leave this screen up here, right? Make sure you get all your stuff. Big takeaways are that in every battle, reg lots. regular people were being impacted. Okay, houses were being burned, farms were being damaged, families had to flee away from the frontier back to the coast, right? Because that's where civilization was. They didn't go further west. That was actually still unexplored, but they had to return to the coastline. So um, ambushes, guerrilla tactics, raids, stuff that just really disrupted regular people life. People who just wanted to be settlers, not really broke into the war. Very disruptive to their experience on the frontier. Yep. See, I uh, see y'all writing. You're filling in your blanks. And uh, obviously, the the photo you see, artist rendition, but pretty descriptive of of uh, how Native Americans were portrayed as savages. They were they were always in war paint. They used their native weapons. It's not exclusively, it's not true that they adopted this kind of a persona, savage persona. The Indians actually had access to guns and gunpowder. So all the stereotypes of bows and arrows and tomahawks and war paint, that's not exclusively true because they were a modern fighting force as well. Actually, here's a, uh, here's a pretty good picture, uh, graphics added of the Indians using uh, gu guns. Uh, of course, that means they had access to gunpowder and more or less fighting the same way the British would fight, or fighting with the same weapons the British would fight with. However, they did not fight the same way the British fought. What do you know about guerrilla tactics and how the Indians use them? They hide behind the trees. Hide behind the trees. Does that make sense or not that make sense? sense? It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to us in 2021 was it the preferred way to I fight back the then? Would walk yes. on the road, it the was not, Alan Shaken said, it was not the preferred way to fight. Why not? Why were European tactics because, you so you behind because of stupid honor? Say it again, Glenn? Because of honor. Because that stupid honor or whatever. Yeah, it was considered gentlemanly <laughs> to meet each other in the open field, to uh, level rifles at each other, and because they're very inaccurate, you had to group everyone together and just fire a volley or just lob a volley of break shot at each other that's considered the gentleman's way to fight it was considered dishonorable to do anything else well how much did the indians care for the british sense none. of honor none none and because of it did they have success or not success success they, did. they had a lot of success because they didn't necessarily care about the european style of fighting or the european sense of honor they were able to use the hide in the wood line hit and run ambush style attacks or I've said it I've already said it guerrilla warfare um, or you know you can be characterized as live to fight another day they valued a little bump and run hit and run ambush where they could regroup and fight again versus the near suicidal method of just marching at each other and throwing a whole lot of numbers into the into the mix and seeing who comes out on top so Pretty, uh, pretty significant that the Indians are using guerrilla tactics. Three more facts here. Let's see here. Uh, so the French, because of this, the French and the Indians dominate the first couple of years of the war, the first three years of the war. 
which is actually an extreme, uh, extremely offensive thing to the world's finest fighting force, the British Army. Now, I don't know how much you've read about recent military history or American involvement in Afghanistan. It's basically spanned more than your whole lifetime. I will tell you, based off of uh, personal experience, that our early days in Afghanistan could be characterized pretty similarly. The Afghans who knew the terrain, Taliban essentially, right, bad guys, who knew the terrain, used different tactics than we, uh, we the American military, were used to, they were able to dominate the first couple of years of fighting. And in fact, they were able to hang on for 20 years despite the extreme advantages of air power, field artillery, guided precision munitions, right? So I'm making a modern connection, which is always what I like to do in history class. Uh, the French and the Indians dominated the war because of guerrilla tactics. The Taliban in Afghanistan, local guerrilla fighters, dominated the war for the first couple of months and even years because of the same reason, guerrilla tactics. Can you describe the picture to you? Sure. Uh, now, so in a lot of these paintings, and they these, these come out, you know, way after the fact, right? It's not like there's an artist there capturing every detail. Uh, but, but, you know, but let's be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this particular. It looks like the Indian is going to be killing someone. Yeah, it looks like the Indian is um, going to be killing someone. You kind of stumped me there, Glenn. I don't, I don't have the answer for this photo. Really I'm trying to find it like not. I do have the answer for another photo coming up, so maybe I can redeem myself. How about that? You are not without you. This is uh, an example of, uh, this was the uh, Fort Oswego, okay, this, and, and this is not the photo that I know a lot about, but this is a pretty good example of siege warfare. They would just encircle the whole thing until the people on the inside ran out of food and resources. Now, obviously, they've got their cannons, they've got a stronghold, they can hang on for a long time, but eventually, if you're not allowed to get out, get more food, water, ammunition, uh, that's how a siege tactics work. World history, we talked about this. Say, the, the Romans did this. Uh, Romans did this a lot. What did we particularly talk about? And we actually had our own siege with catapults and all that. Oh, oh yeah, we used Ryan's that. favorite topic. I always say it's Ryan's favorite topic. The Crusades. We did the siege of Jerusalem of 1187. Same thing here. We're going to talk, we're going to talk more about siege warfare uh, when we get into World War One and Two, because these armies would lay siege to entire uh, towns, and uh, and basically, of course, they're also affecting the civilian population at that point uh, as well. All right, major turning point of the war. So the French and the Indians have been dominating for all the reasons we've stated: guerrilla warfare, um, uh, wilderness tactics, and all that. Well, the British Foreign Minister Pitt, he turns the tide of the war in 1758. He makes a peace alliance with certain Indian tribes. And that does not say all the Indians, but he makes a peace, a peace treaty, makes an alliance with some of the Indian tribes. And he makes the, ooh, the uh, very, very controversial and un-English decision to adopt some of these guerrilla warfare tactics. So I don't know if that's the old Kevin Durant. If you can't beat him, join him. But uh, pretty much, no, put him, put, put Kevin him Durant choke. Him. Anybody? Lion Snake leaves the pit. He's definitely, he's definitely no Giannis. He's definitely not going to Put him in the guillotine. Chop the horse chop. He uh, basically, if you summarize it with kind of a slang term, right? If you can't beat him, join him. He's gonna. Uh, he he decides that um, it is acceptable to lay aside the uh, notion of Englishmen's honor and open battle and open 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 field tactics, and he starts using the guerrilla warfare. And at that point, um, the British start to win the war. So it's almost as if to say they were always the better fighting force, but they're being held back by their tactics. We still write some things down, anybody? So in the end, who wins the war? Me. I told you it's called the French and Indian War, and it's named after the losers. So who wins the war? British. Yeah. In the end, it's a British victory. There's a uh, come on in, Cootie. Come on in. Uh, there's a couple of final battles, a couple of key uh, key British, uh, excuse me, French forts fall. The uh, Indian peace, the, the peace with the Indians, they're not involved anymore. Ominous, ominous. Let's just. Let's just cut to the chase, and this all leads to, excuse me, leads to a British victory. 
you get a chance to write this down. Then I'm going to show you the painting that I wanted to talk about a little bit more thoroughly. What's the end? What are we right? We all written down? <laughs> Uh, for real. <laughs> Hang on, you're filling the blanks coming up. All right, so here, Glenn, here's a picture I did want to show you. So this is a picture of uh, General Wolf, General Wolf of the British Army. Obviously, I don't know if it's obvious or not. I shouldn't say the word obviously. This is not a realistic posture that these men would have assumed on the battlefield. We're not having this like holy grail, Jesus in the manger moment over here while while shots are still being fired. What happens here is that the uh, British actually have turned the tide in the battle. They're about to win. The general here, General Wolf, he's he's on the, the cut, he's on the dying edge, right? He he does die. I'll tell you that. He's so he's kind of in his last couple of breaths here. And somebody, as the story goes, somebody says they're running. And he snaps to, he snaps to, as if he's going to admonish his men for running away from the battle. And he says, who's running? And they say, the French, sir, we've got him on the run. And at that point, he takes his last breath. He says, well, then I can die contented. He died, and, he died, and so the legend of him is that he was about to rise from the dead to whip his boys into shape one more time. But he died content with a British victory. So uh, I don't know how much of that you, you want to choose to believe to be true. How, how would you not know? George Washington. Washington. How would I not know? I wasn't there for this one. I wasn't there for this one. Just goes to show you kind of the folklore that gets built up shot? about some of these dying figures, right? Almost That's elevated true. to a, a worship type status. You know, I don't know if I'll say godlike yeah. status, but they're almost revered and worshiped in a way. Um, and you, you do got to think about how stories got told. No photographs, no video footage, of course. Basically, it's relying on the word of somebody who was there. So uh, however they wanted to tell the story is how they got to tell the story. And, of course, they told the story that made the man look really good. So here we have a little bit more. We win. Now, why do you think I have quote marks around we? America wins. No. UK, 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 United Kingdom, Britain. Uh, at this point, no, British. is the British win. We win the war. And it officially ends, I think this is on your screen, not on your page. Officially ends with the Treaty of Paris of 1783. Why? Why was this thing signed in Paris? Why do you think? It is France. That's true. French was the loser in the war. Paris is seen as a world city at this point, and of course it still is. So Paris is seen as a very significant world city, and this is the first of many treaties of Paris. So uh, I'm not going to confuse you right now by telling you the others, but when we talk about the Treaty of Paris again, and then again, and then again, I'm gonna give you a little. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little mnemonic that'll help you remember the various treaties of Paris. So uh, many, many, many treaties are signed in Paris, and that means that the year of it starts to become pretty significant, so that you can keep them, uh, uh, keep them straight uh, in your brain. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, pause right here. I'm actually gonna show you this video. Uh, you know, some of you know that I. Uh, you know, sometimes teaching method, I show a lot of videos. Other times teaching method, we just got to keep going. This is a time where uh, I've got enough time to show a video or something like that. Uh, kind of as a personal, as a personal little extra, history.com, the history channel. Oh man, they got so much good stuff. So if you're ever really stumped on a stumped on a subject, if you let me tell you how the internet works. If you type in French and India War, right? Let's just pick our topic of today. You type in French and India War, you're going to get Wikipedia. Then you're going to get history.com. Then you're going to get Britannica.com. If it's a person that you're typing in, you might get biography.com. And then you're probably going to get nationalgeographic.com. And then whatever the hyperlink associated with those names are. Y'all, skip past Wikipedia. Okay? 
go to history, Britannica, biography, or National Geographic. Those are strongly trusted sources. Now, our tendency is to go with the number one, which is Wikipedia. And it's not all bad, okay? But let me encourage you that if you get into history.com, Britannica, biography, and National Geographic, you are dealing with some legitimate sources. And they, these are some really well-written articles and or videos. And if you just ever, like, talk about going down a black hole, like, maybe it's just me, I don't know. But, like, you click one thing, and then you click another thing, and then all of a sudden, filling your brain up with good stuff. Or you guys can TikTok. I don't know. Make your own choices. I'll take TikTok. From the standpoint of the population of America, this competition, you're... From the very beginning, colonialism in America meant competition. European countries were eager to gobble up as much land as possible in the new world. Sometimes this competition turned into open warfare, and the French and Indian War is a perfect example of this. Here's a crash course of five things about the war to get young people. North America was a big, beautiful place full of endless opportunities, and Great Britain and France each wanted a piece of the action. The British controlled their 13 colonies and were looking to expand west. The French occupied Canada and were looking to expand south. It was inevitable that they bump into each other, and that's exactly what happened in the Ohio River Valley, an important trading area with access to the Mississippi River. The French and Indian War marked the debut of 21-year-old George Washington, a lieutenant colonel for the militia in the British colony of Virginia. In 1754, he was ordered to protect a British fort near what is now Pittsburgh. On the way, Washington encountered a French military unit, and the two sides fought in the first battle of the French and Indian War, the Battle of Jumonville Glen. Washington was young, but he was quickly gaining the experience he needed to eventually command the Continental Army. Years of territorial scuffles turned into full-blown declarations of war in 1756. As fighting broke out, the British and French sought allies among the local Native American populations. The French were familiar with many tribes through trade and recruited the Potawatomi, Winnebago, Ojibwa, Mississauga, and the Huron, while the British turned to the Iroquois Confederacy. At first, the French were winning a lot. They simply had more troops and better supplies than the British Army and drove them back toward the 13 colonies. But the tide turned in 1757 when British Secretary of State William Pitt took control of the war. Dreaming of a vast British Empire, he made it his mission to defeat the French in North America, pouring in generous funds it, and the turning point, remember? to the ground. The war ended with the French defeat at the Battle of Quebec and the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763. The British gained control of Canada and all land east of the Mississippi River. It may seem that the British made out well after all was said and done, but there was a catch. You see, William Pitt borrowed heavily to finance the French and Indian War, which left his nation in tons of debt. To make up for it, the British taxed American colonists up the wazoo. Americans didn't particularly appreciate this. Years of protests, rallies, town hall meetings, and petitions would eventually lead to the American Revolution and the creation of the United States. The French and Indian War may not have had the glorious battles or fearless heroes of other great conflicts, but it was one of the most consequential wars in American history. It also opened the eyes of a young military leader to the tyranny of the British, a man who would go on to be the first American president. Mm. Give the light. Alright, so War Thunder, the nursery online action game. War Thunder this year's first major up. It's caused major update. Alright, so a little bit more of the Treaty of Paris. What what uh what was the uh, outcome of it? You know, why did it matter? Well, the British gained a lot of land. A lot, a lot. The Can the French lost what was Canadian territory, okay, present day Canada Canadian territories and land that was uh, east of the Mississippi River. So this is the river. Remember, remember, we're not dealing with California yet, right? We're dealing with this portion of land right here. 
England got all French territory uh, all the way down to Florida. Okay, so, just, so we're not encroaching on Spanish territory just yet. And rights to the Caribbean slave trade. So, you know, just a big, a big land turnover. You know, jot down the, the, the things that are on your notes. And then Spain, they were in it, they were in it as well. They get some French territory. They, uh, they didn't do any of the fighting, but they still gained some French territory. So it was just a big, uh, big uh, throwdown, big smackdown to uh, what France used to have reapportioned to the uh, British and the Spanish. Down our stuff down. What are you, what are you looking for? Oh, shoot, I'm supposed to be writing it down. Yep, there are some gaps here, or there's some blanks for you to fill in. So, orange is colonies, yellow is English, but not colonies. Spain into the, uh, into the, the Florida areas. Basically, no more French to be seen. I'm going to move on. I can always go back. From the Treaty of Paris of 1763, we get the Proclamation of 1763. And this is where I want you to take yourself back to your parchment paper, the journal that you did at the beginning of class. Proclamation of 1763 states that colonists, colonists, not English people, but colonists specifically, are not allowed to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. This was all the new land that had been gained in the treaty. There's not a hard line that declares, you know, that do not cross this line. It's more or less an imaginary line across the peaks, if you will, the ridge line of the Appalachians Mountains. So shown by the, the, the red line here, actually, I can move to this one now, bigger screen. What if you were told you were exclusively confined to your region even in the spirit of discovery or financial gain or your family just wants to spread their wings and go to another place, you were told that you cannot do so. Uh, remember, what were, what were your responses in the journal? Glenn, you said? I killed people. Kill. You said? Nate, you said? What was your journal entry? What did you say? You, you couldn't move around. Posse, that's right. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. And then who said riot? I think someone said riot. Yeah. Madeline, you said you were riot? You said protest? Protest, right? So we're in general agreement, right? Now, I kind of, I asked you, hey, Hunter, Tyler. I'm trying to get some answers. Okay, okay. We'll have time for that. We're going to wrap up a little early, and I will let you uh, tidy up all your notes for the week, right? So so you can't say I didn't give you that tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah! Tomorrow, we're in agreement. Now, I asked you the question through your 2021 lens, right? And you know, I'm sure you're thinking about things like, mm, what if I have a passport? Uh, I'm fully vaccinated, so I should be able to do that. Like, they can't tell me where I can and can't go. I'm free, free country, isn't it? So we approach it from our 2021 perspective. Well, guess what? Is that all that different from what they were being told in 1763? No. They were being told. So they grabbed guns and started killing them. You can't go any farther. So they killed people. So they grabbed guns. So, yeah, ultimately, it, yeah, ultimately, it turns into a rebellion. I want to feel so people. you guys, I'm very proud of I'm very proud of this moment. You have arrived at an understanding that these things imposed by the crown are naturally going to lead to humans. No matter what background you have, right? Cultural, social, economic, time period, 2000s versus 1700s. The natural response of humans when they are, uh, when their freedoms are infringed upon is to rebel. So please remember that when we talk about major outcomes of the Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Paris of 1763 and the French and Indian War as a whole. It's setting the stage for rebellion. That's the big takeaway. Effects of the war, there are a couple. There is an additional, there's a follow-on war called Pontiac's Rebellion or Pontiac's War. Basically, a chief Pontiac, he uh, reforms in a Native American alliance, and he wants to strike back at, back at the British. They just, re, they just gained, formally, right, via the treaty, they gained a whole lot of Native American lands. But, you know, tell that to a free man that you can just take over his home. Pontiac 
realigned these Native Americans. Now, this is kind of significant because they've previously been fractured. Some of them supported the French, some of them supported the British, others just tried to stay out of it. Well, now they have a common reason to want to fight against the British, which is the fact that all of their homes just got taken. Now they're paying taxes on the place they used to live freely. So this greatly increases friction uh, between the, oh, oh, sorry. It greatly increases friction between uh, everyone who's experiencing the conflict, but it's this idea that the colonies are being taxed for the war that increases friction between the colonies and the Great Britain, and British specifically. And remember, who is responsible for the first skirmish that started the war in the first place? You are. George Washington. 21-year-old George Washington is, pre is the leader of the first fight. And indirectly, all right, I'm not, you can't pin it on him, you know, there's plenty of other variables. But quite indirectly, George Washington sparks the conflict that brings on the taxes that starts the rebellion. So George Washington was uh, in the middle of it all far more than uh, far more than uh, maybe you knew before this class period. What are your questions? This should wrap. What, what gaps do we have on your notes? How old are you? Yes. I'm 21 years old. I'm Major George Washington. So of the, how of the you British Army. I'm 21 too. So, uh, wait, wait, wait. if you remember, George Washington eventually, he is, he's a militia leader, which is not as respected as the uh, standing army. So because of that, he resigns his commission well, that's when he's like 25, in the Virginia militia. Ultimately, right, we, we know George Washington had several occupations. Ultimately, he rejoins the rebellion, the American rebellion, and becomes the chief in that battle. So I, I feel like someone asked me to go back at some point. Hunter, did you get everything you needed? Yes, sir. You got everything you needed? I'm trying. No. All right, do this as a little bit of a, um, we're just going to do it as a group. Take it out the door, okay? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I don't have a handout for anything like that. So let's just talk about this. If you're given a map like this, we can identify <laughs> British colonies. This was given up in the war. Given up. This is where France now belongs. This is where Spain now belongs. Tiny little portion here that was also given up, but it's significant because it's along the water. So this map is given to you. Immediately, I can identify several things, and after, you know, even before I read the questions. Now, having I, having identified the topic of the map, I bet I'm like, hmm, let's see what they're actually going to ask me. Question number one: the word "seated" most likely means. Man, this is almost like a vocab question. You mean I'm going to get U.S. history points for a vocab question? That's awesome. What do we think? A. Independent. B. Destroyed. C. Awarded to. Or D. Explained. Uh, question number one. Let me ask Logan Matters. What do you think of the question? I'm wondering if it caught me, didn't See? What do you think? I cannot. Glim or uh, Alan. Alan, what do you say? C. C. So let's let's replace the word. Awarded to. Was this who was this awarded to? The British. Who was this awarded to? The Spaniards. Okay, awarded to fit. Independent wouldn't work. It wasn't destroyed. Explained like that's the, I don't know, that's irrelevant. Awarded to. That's what the word seated means. So you, you learned a new vocab word today. If you see the word seated, C-E-D-E-D, -E -D -E you can understand it to mean awarded to. Uh, what are some current US states in the seated territory? So little uh, little geography required here. What US what US state is right around these big lakes? Michigan. Georgia. Michigan. Nah, Georgia's not in a ceded state. Georgia's already a colony. Alabama. Alabama, for sure. What's this port city right here? New York. New Orleans. New Orleans, which is Louisiana. Pennsylvania. Uh, Mississippi as well. Nah, Pennsylvania is in the colony of colonies. North Dakota. Tokyo. Ohio. What was the original yeah. val uh, valley they really cared about? Cleveland, Ohio. 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 Yeah, Ohio. Wisconsin. Michigan. North Dakota. Bro, I know Tokyo. Oh, no. Detroit. Detroit. I know Tokyo. Uh, probably a little bit of Iowa and Illinois in there as well. Yeah, yeah. I know California. I said Wisconsin. Oh, Kentucky. Yeah, Kentucky would have been there as well. So. 
Okay, good. So a great bit of what we today would probably call the Midwest. Big part of the Midwest was the uh, seated in this. All right, and then what line separated the British colonies from the land ceded to them? Imaginary line follows a major terrain feature. What uh what what where did it come out of? Appalachian Mountains. The line is synonymous with the uh, the proclamation. So I kind of just said the word. What 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 big proclamation just um, determines this line? The proclamation of Look at your notes. Look at your notes. Proclamation of it's literally a bold header. You know what, guys? Ooh, let me check myself real quick. I had to make this correction on the slides. It is actually on numbers. It's the Proclamation of 1763, and I apologize for that, okay? Proclamation of 1763. So on your notes, do scratch that out. I had to, I had to correct it on the uh, on the slides as well. So I apologize for that. Good catch, good catch by someone. Proclamation of 1763. What was the major terrain feature that it used? Appalachian Mountains. Appalachian Mountains. Anybody ever walk the Appalachian Trail, the AT? Right, it starts in Georgia or it finishes in Georgia, I suppose, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, so think about just I'm trying at this point I'm trying to give you tricks to memorize stuff. Think about what is relevant to you and your home. The Appalachian Mountains passed through Georgia. The Appalachian Mountains were the boundary for the proclamation of 1763. So French and Indian War starts a rebellion. Tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit more about starting that rebellion, okay, outside of the scope of the French and Indian War. So tomorrow's a really important day. You know, guy, I don't know about you. Let me give you a personal story. Mr. Mr. Swanson's story. When, I, when they said you're going to teach U.S. history, I thought, man, we're going to spend, this is pretty much like revolution class, right? Guys, U.S. history is way more than just the American Revolution. Uh, I really thought I'd be like showing the Patriot and talking about like all the key personalities in depth. We're going to have classroom visits from Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton. We're going to watch Hamilton. That would be an awesome, very, very rich class about the American Revolution. I thought that's what U.S. history was. That's exactly what I'm saying, Glenn. I thought that's what U.S. history was. But here's your big butt. I like big butts thinking kind of a lot. Whoa, there is, is so much more to U.S. history that is just as exciting. Okay, It is not just about how the country was formed. There is so much more to get to. So what I'm saying is these next two days, Friday and Monday, I really agree, and, and Tuesday, these next three days are that portion of the American Revolution. So don't, don't skip these next three days. Okay? These next three days are the American Revolution be extremely interesting all the factoids that we whether we like to get to but well, all I got is three days so please don't then miss these next three because make it a reward day or a holiday or something they have to be but they do they do oh, yeah. the patriot is the reason I joined the United States Army you have to be the patriot came out in my sixth grade year and uh, I just got inner motivated and I never looked back. Who do I have to be? Who do you Robert E. Lee? I got to be a union soldier. No, I'm going to be a union I got to be a union I got to be a union soldier. Yeah, in World War II, let us dress up at my house. If you like, who do you want to watch all right, guys, hey, so we did really well on time. Here's what I'm going to ask of you. Uh, I got, I pulled out, I've always got, ooh, I'm losing my voice as well, so just like, don't make me go there. Um, I've always got, like, the next extra thing, okay? So given that we have a little bit of time, I'm going to pull out one of my uh, extra videos. Then I'm going to hand you what is an article. And it's it was gonna be article homework. Actually, she can do that right now. It's gonna be an article reading homework. But if you're wise, you'll use these next. Actually, Miss Rogers, don't do it quite yet, so they're not checked into the video. Perfect. And then we'll do it. If you're wise, you can use the final ten minutes of class to read your article, and then you know even highlight key points. And we are gonna have an article quiz in the morning. Okay, so that's not a threat. That's a promise. I got a question. Okay, question. Who, who invented Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Who? 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 Who?
Uh, oh, go right guys, you've heard me say it. For every video I show in class, I watch like 15 videos to find the good ones. This actually comes from the Mount Vernon National Monument, which is George Washington's home. So it's a pretty authoritative source on George Washington, and it is discussing his role in the French and Indian War. So here we go. George Washington is 22 years old and he's the same age. He was 22. He's 21. College and trying to decide what they want to do with their lives. He's young, he's full of energy, he's athletic, he's vigorous, he's kind of full of himself. He takes the world at his fingertips and he's ready to conquer. And he's full of ambition. He wants to prove that he's as good a man, if not better, than anybody else. And the sky is the limit. So when he meets with Governor Dinwiddie, 